Disrupting TB, Understanding the Culture of Corrections, sponsored by the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center. Today's event is scheduled for one and a half hours, including the Q&A question and answer period at the end of the presentation. We may run past that time if we have a lot of questions, but it's okay to leave at 12.30 if necessary. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. First, we have Ellen Murray, who is a nurse who received her bachelor's in science of nursing degree from Jacksonville University. Ellen has been a nurse for more than 28 years, working in a variety of settings, which includes 18 years in correctional settings. She currently serves as a training specialist for the Southeastern National TB Center. But prior to joining the SNTC team, Ellen worked as a nursing consultant for the Florida Department of Health Bureau of TB and Refugee Health where she coordinated education training and communication activities between public health and correctional settings. Also joining us today is Tara Wilds. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Florida with a criminal justice major. She is currently the Chief of Jails Division for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office in Florida with the responsibility for the operations and support units for approximately 2,200 inmates. She has worked as frontline staff in administration in the sheriff's office, including administrative lieutenant for special projects, watch commander, and a, as a correctional sergeant and line officer. Chief Wilde holds many certifications and is an instructor for various agencies, including the FBI and SNTC. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ellen Murray. Ellen? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do today, and uh, Chief Wiles is right here with me, we're going to be talking a lot about the different types of facilities and the prisonization, if you will, or correctionalization of staff and inmates. And as Karen pointed out, I was a nurse working in a jail. I used to say I was in jail for 17 years and they let me out, but that's uh, a little different. I actually worked in a correctional facility. And so a lot of what you hear today will be what we've done in our facilities, and you'll hear Chief Wiles uh, going through what she's done as well. The first slide that we want to talk to you about is the hierarchy within the walls of corrections. And we use the terminology corrections instead of prison um, because there are many types of correctional facilities. But for corrections, it generally is a military type and the administrative structure is something you want to identify. Those of you who are out that do not work in corrections, what's happening in that uh, correctional facility? It's generally a military type regime. They have shifts and squads, and they are supported by operations, different types of programs as well, and you're gonna hear about some of those. Um, they have generally security overall, and very little autonomy. Medical's a little bit different from that. In a correctional facility, it's governed by a supervisory uh, staff, and then you have your medical staff who are doing the hands-on day-to-day care, often more lateral and some autonomy. They're able to make decisions. And what we'd like to do is actually turn this over and do some polling questions where we want you to interact with us. Our first polling question is, where do you work? And what you do is you click on whichever one you're at, and we will be able to see who it is uh, that is answering. It's completely anonymous, so go ahead and use one of your use your mouse and just click on either corrections, public health, or other. We kind of want to get a feel of what our audience is. If you have the opportunity, go ahead and click on that. And what we'd like to see now is what are the results? Um, you can actually see this live and in person on your screen. Hopefully. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and turn this over. Okay. 
Um, what we're going to look at now is just going into the presentation. Uh, we weren't able to find that. That's all right. We'll do that. So we get a little bit of an idea of who our audience is. And then I'm going to turn this over to Chief Wilds and let her talk a little bit about the different types of correctional facilities. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, let me give you a little corrections 101 here and talk about the different types of correctional facilities. And I'll explain at the end the reasons why it's important to know the type of facility that you're dealing with. We'll start with the, the big guys, the federal. Federal prisons can be short or long term and includes prison and detention facilities. The difference is typically, and there are differences between prisons and jails, is that prisons are going to be your long-term facilities, usually people that have been sentenced to in excess of one year in time, and detention facilities or jails are for very much more short-term type individuals. They may be pretrial, they may be waiting to be transferred to prison, they may be waiting to transfer to another facility, such as the ICE detention centers. ICE is formerly INS, you may know it as that, but it's now Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. This is where a lot of people who are awaiting deportation or illegal aliens are housed. They generally don't have criminal charges. They may have had criminal charges and are on their way to being deported out of the country. Um, sometimes the ICE detention centers will contract with local jails to house overflow. It mentioned earlier on that we had 22 inmates, uh, 2,200 inmates in our facility in Jacksonville. Well, actually, today we're closer to 2,800. So that just lets you know that all over the country, most facilities are overcrowded and struggling to find room for their inmates. So there's a lot of contracts that go out with different facilities, and the feds are usually really good as far as establishing contracts and helping local jails with building issues and all. State prisons, your state department of corrections, whatever state you're in, those are typically going to be called prisons. They're going to be run by your state. Oftentimes they have dedicated TV program staff. So you'll have somebody in prison that you'll be able to call in, liaison with, and you'll, you'll basically have a little bit easier type of communication. But then let's talk about the county jails, our short-term facilities. And those include jails and detention facilities. They're usually run by the sheriff of the county. They could be run by a private corporation, just as could state prisons and federal prisons as well. Some, some counties have a public health trust, or the county commissioners actually run the jail. But in general, it's run by the sheriff. And this is the one thing to keep in mind whenever you're dealing with corrections is there's oftentimes no definition. You're going to have to find out what's happening with you locally. We'll talk about things in generalities, and, and we'll tell you the, the way things typically are, but you're going to need to go out and find what it's like in your particular county, your particular region, whatever, whatever group that you're dealing with. Another difference between the county and state facilities, between a prison and a jail, is not just the length of time inmates stay there, but it's also in the diversity of the inmates. In a county jail or a city facility, you get whoever the police bring in. You're going to have anybody there from your drunken, disorderly guy that comes in for 24 hours on the weekend, sobers up, to somebody that's perhaps waiting to go to death row at state prison. You run the entire gamut. You may be holding illegal aliens for ICE. You've got a huge, diverse population or a huge diversity of population in county or city facilities. Prison facilities are usually going to be a little bit less diverse. It's going to be based on what their crime is, like a maximum type crime. You'll keep all of your violent felonies together, those sort of situations. City facilities are generally going to be small and usually very short term. They're often just holding facilities. But again, like I explained before, before sometimes they'll contract out with federal, you know, and they'll be, they'll be housing people for pay. So they too could have any of the, any of the, um, any of the above type, or the types of inmates that we've talked about. And juvenile can run the gamut just as well. Most of your juvenile facilities, it can be pretrial, it can be holding people to be transferred into a long-term juvenile facility, it really can be any of the different types of individuals that we've already talked about. The Division of Immigration and Health Services, 
serves the illegal immigrant population who may be incarcerated. And one thing that's changing in our country now is because of the illegal immigration issues, there's a lot more emphasis on that in many communities. And I know in Jacksonville, and I know also in Collier County, Florida, and Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, they are contracting with ICE to actually have the local police officers and corrections officers essentially serve as Border Patrol type agents. And through that process, we're probably going to be housing a lot more illegal immigrant population in our local facilities. The reason that's important to you is, again, this is another, this is another group that could have significant issues as far as infectious disease go, and you need to know what's happening in your particular community. Remember, too, that inmates are going to be housed based on their charges and who has who has jurisdiction over those charges. Most of the time, your charges are going to have to be disposed of your criminal charges before you go to an ICE or a federal type facility. So if you're trying to track somebody down, for instance, following the charges and who has jurisdiction on those charges can be very, very critical. Thank you, Chief Wells. Um, we noticed that the polling questions did not uh, occur or they weren't, the link wasn't happening. We're going to try it again. And what we'd like to see is if you can, please go ahead and click on where do you work, Correct, either corrections, public health, or other. And of course, you have the ability to not vote at all. Um, and you should be seeing the results on your screen over to the very right. Um, so it looks like we've got a large number of people working in public health. So that's a, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful thing. Most correctional people know about corrections anyway, so. Uh, although we have had some people who, who really did not. Uh, so with that, we want to take another polling question and just try to find out a little bit about how often do you communicate with your correctional facility and or your public health, if you're in corrections, um, with the TB program? And of course, uh, you know, you have regularly face-to-face, -face, regularly by phone only, as needed or never. And it'll be very interesting um, because this is actually something that is the basis of our talk today. I'll give you another uh, moment or two because we still have some people who are uh, doing their polling questions. Okay. And for the moment, what we will look at, uh, another question, who is the best source of information uh, that you speak to when you're identifying the custody of an inmate? Is it medical? Is it classifications? Is it the newspaper? Or is it public health? Great. Okay. With that, let's go back into our presentation and just hear a little bit more about how an inmate moves through the system. This is actually going to help you to identify some of the challenges that you face when you're trying to deal with a TB inmate. And I'll turn this back over to Chief Wilde. Thank you. Essentially, you're going to go through the same type of process, whether you're coming into a jail or coming into a prison or any type of correctional facility, there are certain things that will be done. And understanding that generally will help you kind of negotiate it in your particular area or system. Intake or booking, that's kind of self-explanatory. That's where folks are coming in. Look at the difference between the amount of contact that the officer has with the inmate coming, coming into, the, into the facility. You can see that there's a lot of face-to-face -face contact potentially in these kind of situations. This, is, this individual coming in is going to be searched. There's going to be a lot of direct, very close contact with individuals as they come in. Their property will be exchanged. There will be a lot of, of discussion between the incoming inmate and the booking officers. So think about that from the perspective of exposure and the perspective of TV, and you can see where there's some potential opportunities for 
you know, an exchange to occur in, in this particular kind of setting. Oftentimes, too, as people come into the facility, they'll go into holding cells for brief periods of time, and they'll usually not be by themselves sitting in a holding cell. A lot of times, depending on the size of the facility, there can be anywhere from 5, 10, even upwards of 50 people in a holding cell or holding area with them as they await the intake and booking process. Think, too, about the possibility of mass arrests, you know, civil demonstrations, things like that, where large numbers of people can be arrested at one time and be processed through the system. And then think about how, how would you go back, how would you track all these individuals down? Who would you go to? Who would you talk to? How would you know who came in when? So it can be an easy thing to track down. It can be very difficult to track down. Cell classifications, within a correctional facility, there's going to be different definitions for different cells. And learning how to speak the language is really important. But even if you think you know how to speak the language, always ask at your particular facility, what do you mean by a cell? Or describe your cell to me. Um, you, have, you say he's in a dorm. Tell me about the dorm. How is the dorm set up? I'm going to tell you quickly in generalities, again, what each of these means. A cell can be any room in a facility where you keep inmates, except the dormitory. A dormitory is typically multiple occupancy. A cell is typically single occupancy, but not always. A lot of cells are double bunked. For instance, in our facility right now, our cells are triple bunked. So we can tell somebody to go to their cell, and they've got two bunk mates in there with them. So you need to find out from the facility what do they mean by a cell, what do they mean by a dormitory, uh, where, how many men or women are housed in that particular dormitory. You also, again, like I've mentioned, that you have holding cells, which is basically a transitory cell where any number of people can be coming and going, awaiting a process like booking, waiting to go to court, waiting to go to other different facilities, waiting to go to the clinic. There's usually holding cells associated with the clinic or infirmary in the, in the correctional facility. And you'll also have open type dormitories, and they're often direct supervision. If you'll look down in your lower right hand corner there, where the officer is inside the dorm with the inmates, you can see their cells up on each of those tiers. Individual cells may house one, two, or like I said, three people. But then you have this large common area that's out there with the officer, that's typically called a day room, and they're usually, inmates are usually out and about during the day period. Also, let's talk for just a quick minute about isolation cells. Again, ask your facility what do they mean when they say somebody is isolated or segregated. Now, common sense may tell you, well, isolation, they're going to be by themselves, right? Not necessarily so. Again, in a facility that's overcrowded, might be single, might be double bunked, might be triple bunked, a cell that would usually be used to house one person may actually be housing two or even more in some cases. And you'll also hear different terminology. They'll call it isolation. They'll call it segregation. They will, and segregation just means you're removed from the general population, which is everybody else. And again, it may mean that you're just segregated in a different dorm, which remember a dorm is multiple occupancy, but you may be segregated from the general population. So make sure when you're trying to track some of these things down that you're asking the people in the facility, well, tell me, what, tell me about the segregation cell. Who's in there? How, how do you do that? How is that housed? And remember, for TB purposes, negative air pressure is going to be critical in stemming the flow of any infection. Up here in the corner, you can see a, a negative air pressure cell being checked. Now, you know, the easy way, and a lot of times when you're talking with correctional personnel, you're going to ask, Is your, are your isolation cells negative air pressure? They're going to go, well, I don't know. They may not be familiar with that terminology. Ask them when they open the door, does the air blow out at you or does it suck in? Now, ask them if it sucks or blows can um, create some communication issues sometimes, but that you got to remember, too, that humor sometimes helps diffuse some of the seriousness of these situations. And the biggest thing is you're getting the answer of what is happening in that facility and where these individuals are housed at. Now let's change from the classification of the cell to the classification of the inmate and the personnel who work in the classification setting. Every facility is going to have a classification officer. 
they may have a classification unit with, a, with an entire hierarchy, like a lieutenant and a sergeant and several officers who work in classification. Some facilities may not have officers working in classification. There may be civilians working in, in this area. And what classification does is these are the individuals who sort the inmates. They try to get like individuals as much as possible into like settings in the most least restrictive setting possible. There's a number of accreditation standards, and most states have particular standards as to classification, who can be housed with who. There's very simple ways to do it, which is basically separating sentence from pretrial, or separating felony from misdemeanor, separating violent from nonviolent. You can kind of see how that goes, but you want to try to get the same type of individuals in the same cell and, and kind of reach a stasis so that when you're dealing with hun between hundreds or thousands of inmates in a facility, you've got to figure out what works best so there's often a lot of movement. The people that work in classifications are going to be your key to tracking down where, where these inmates were housed when. They're going to be able to tell you how they've moved the facility, who their bunk mates have been, what dorm they've been in, when they went to court, when they went to the clinic. Classification is going to know these things. Classification is also going to know if they have negative air pressure cells and where those cells are located, who's been in them, how long has those, have those person been in them. And they also work directly with the inmates, interviewing them as they come in and also as their status changes. For instance, a pretrial inmate becomes sentenced. They're going to see classification again. Their housing is going to change, and they're, they're going to collect demographics at every one of these steps along the way. So you can see how important it is for you to find out who's in classification in your facility so that you can get the information that you need when you're, when you're tracking, trying to track somebody down or find out where they've been. Releasing staff often work very closely with classification. And again, if you're doing a contact investigation, you're trying to find where somebody went, then you're going to need to know who released them, when they were released, did they have any kind of forwarding address, what address did they have in their paperwork, in their demographics. Also remember, too, that releasing is going to be typically the home of the paperwork. If you want to examine an inmate file, releasing is usually going to be where that paper file is going to be kept. And also, releasing staff can help you, even if an individual, say, is transient and doesn't have an address, there's often other things that releasing can help you with to try to find out possibly where this person went. As an example, if they went to state prison, obviously that's going to be easy. We're going to be able to tell you the prison that they went to. But say they were released out on bond, or the judge said, you know, I'm going to release you on, on your own recognizance until your trial. Releasing personnel will be able to perhaps tell you who they listed as their next of kin, where that person lives, um, who did they contact while they were here. A lot of facilities maintain phone records of the calls that inmates made, so they'll be able to tell you, well, he didn't leave an address, but here are the people that he called while he's here, and here's their phone numbers. It gives you a starting point. And also, releasing is where people are going to be not just processed out, but we're going to hopefully make sure we're processing the right people out. We're going to be comparing their fingerprints, their photographs, and also making sure that we have the proper authority to release them. In a jail, in particular, there aren't a lot of um, decisions made by jail personnel as to who comes in and who goes out. The police make the decision who comes in through arrest. The courts essentially make the decision of who goes out, whether they're sentenced or whether they've received a bond, those kind of things. So remember, in, when you're talking with people in a jail-type setting, they may not have as much control as you think as far as when an inmate comes and goes. They're typically being told by somebody else. Thank you, Chief Wiles. All right, we're going to go now to another polling question. And remember, this is completely anonymous. Um, nobody knows what your answer is. Uh, is there a formal written discharge plan between the correctional facility and the public health department in your area? And we'll take a moment to see how that goes. Okay. Um, great. It looks like 62% said no. And 12% said yes. This is actually a very important key 
to uh, beginning the process of learning about corrections. So we appreciate your honesty. Um, one other thing, if you have a formal written discharge plan, is it effective? So for those of you who did say yes, um, it's nice to know that it, that it truly is effective. That's a very important um, aspect when we talk about these kinds of things because we will be talking um, a little bit about some policies and procedures when you write them, make sure that they're effective and they actually work. Great, 83% said yes, 14% said no, they're not, but I'm sure, you know, learning about just how corrections works is really going to be the beginning of that. All right, and now we have something that we'd like to do with you, and that is to actually demonstrate to you how an inmate goes through a jail. So I'm going to turn this back over to Chief Wiles again for a moment. It's the next best thing to be arrested yourself, okay? We, since we couldn't put all of you in jail, what we decided we'd do is kind of walk you through the process and let you get the feel for it. But this is a simulation, and again, we're talking in generalities. The very best thing you can do is go to your local facility and get one of the personnel there to walk you through it so you can see it, you can smell it, and you can feel it. You can see what this process looks like. That can become incredibly important down the line when you're trying to put things back together, when you're trying to put the pieces of a puzzle together and figure out what has gone on. It's really nice to know the general process, but you need to know the specific process for, you, for the facilities that you deal with. Typically, just walking back through it, people are going to be arrested, the police are going to arrest them, they're going to come into the jail. When they come inside a jail, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to be searched. They're going to be searched thoroughly. It's usually a pat search. Typically, it is not a strip search, but that can happen in certain circumstances. The uh, next step is going to be their property will usually be inventoried. They may be changed into a jail uniform. Some facilities allow inmates to keep their personal clothes. They're going to be fingerprinted and photographed. They're going to, demographics are going to be taken. That's the actual booking process is the collection of those demographics. You're not really discussing the charge or the nature of it or anything like that. We're just gathering the information that we need about you so that we can start your record in the system and make sure that the record from your criminal charges go to all the appropriate places, to the courts, to the attorneys, to the public defender, wherever it's going to go from, from that point forward. After you've been intaked, property, and then identified. And these, these steps can vary in each facility, but basically this is going to happen every single time. You may end up going to a holding cell awaiting medical screening. You may go to a holding cell at any point in time in this process. You may be allowed visitation at this point in time. Your attorney may want to come in and see you. A bondsman may come in and see you. So you may be having contacts there even this early on in the process that you may have to dig to find where those contacts, who those contacts were, because a lot of times there's, there's going to be records in different places. The one good thing about dealing with a correction facility is, is we really, really like paper and we really like logs. And there is going to be a record kept of that individual at each step in this process. There, you should be able to go back and find a piece of paper or in some cases an electronic file somewhere that can tell you at this time, this person was being fingerprinted. At this time, this person was talking with their attorney or their bondsman. So you can go back and, and oftentimes do a very, very comprehensive timeline of where somebody was in a particular facility. Medical screening often and unfortunately comes at the end of the intake process. If I ever, ever get the opportunity to build you know, a perfect jail, I'm going to put it at the beginning of the intake process because there's so much information that everyone needs for medical that we would like to know that just as upfront as, as possible when somebody comes into the system. But again, in most cases, it's, it's happening at the end. And medical screening can also vary wildly from facility to facility. Oftentimes, if somebody's going to prison, for example, they'll have a very intensive 
intake screening. I mean, it'll usually include a complete physical workup and a complete medical history. It can often take an hour or longer. You're being booked into a large urban jail correctional facility. It's probably going to be anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. It's going to be a very brief medical history. They may take your temperature and blood pressure. They may weigh you. They may look at you and say, yeah, uh, yeah, you look like you're about 185, and move on from there. This is something that you need to find out when you're interviewing your facility's medical staff. What, what does their medical screening consist of? You need to know what they're doing so you can, again, go back and look at things like weight. Rapid weight loss can be very indicative of potential TB. And if you're not getting good and accurate data from the medical people there, it's going to be difficult for you to make some of the decisions that, that you need to make. When to do a skin test. Most facilities are not going to skin test people. Most facilities, most jail facilities aren't going to skin test people when they first come in because remember the transient nature of this population. Over 50% of these inmates will be out of there within 72 hours. So if you do a skin test, when are you going to find them to do the reading? You can't hold them there to do the reading, not, not legally. So most of the time, those kind of things and those kind of lab tests are done after a person has been there between five and seven days. Once you've been there that long, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be there until, until your trial comes up or until your bond is reduced or you're sentenced. So that's usually how that works in local facilities. You'll notice, too, as well, the nurse administering medication in the middle there. Um, this is often the way medication is delivered in a correctional facility. There'll usually be an officer watching. It's directly observed therapy, DOT. When I first started hearing about that, I never could figure it out. I kept thinking, what does Department of Transportation have to do with medical? I never could figure that out. But after I figured out that it was direct observed therapy, okay, they're watching people take medicine. You'll see the lady down here opening her mouth in the lower right-hand corner. And ask your facility what kind of policy they have for medication. Is it directly observed therapy? Some facilities have what's called KOP, or keep on person, for certain kinds of medications. Typically, that would not be for TB meds, but hey, if you don't ask, you don't know. Also, over-the-counter drugs. You don't think about inmates as potentially having drugs or even, you know, being able to take a Tylenol or something like that if they had a fever, trying to keep a fever down. But some facilities do sell amount, certain amounts of over-the-counter drugs on their commissary, so again, these are things that you need to know. What is it like in your particular facility? Thank you, Chief Wiles. Um, one of the things that we also want to talk about is discharging an inmate. And uh, Chief Wiles did a wonderful job of taking you through the beginning part of the jail. We're going to take inmate Carlos here and talk a little bit about uh, the TB case that uh, this particular gentleman was uh, had, and what happened to him? Inmate Carlos was only there f at that facility for 72 hours, and unfortunately, he uh, was in a very large cell, and he was the one in this boat-like structure on the floor. Um, Typically, in the classification area, they have them housed in there, and they will put a bed number in there, but you may not realize that they're not actually in a bed. They may be in this boat, they call it, uh, on the floor, and that's an important piece to ask because who knows where that boat could have been. Uh, that's, sometimes they move these around. Sometimes they move it into a, a cell, smaller cell. So you need to sometimes go to that place where he was housed and actually see what was happening, where they were, and who they hung around with. He, only, he was only there for 72 hours, and of course he was smear positive. He was three plus on his sputum. Uh, that didn't get picked up until after this particular inmate was released. And so what was found was this person, when they went to the medical department and asked where this inmate went, they said, he got time served, released. And that's all they knew. Well, typically for these kinds of things, an inmate can go anywhere. They can be sent to the hospital, and in the computer it will say released. 
Um, the people that will have this information will be your classifications officer or that jail record. That will tell exactly where they went. They could have gone to the street or to the community and typically what happens is they end up under a bridge or if it's a transient, you know, they end up in a park or whatever. They may be sentenced to a work release area or a work camp. They may go home. They may actually go to another facility. And so these are some of the things that you need to ask, not all, only just medical. If medical says he was released, you can actually ask those classifications people if they would pull the jail record or if they could tell you where this person may have been released. Okay. With that, we actually want to go to another polling question. Hope you're having fun with these. I know I am because I think <laughs> this is awesome to be able to actually hear live from, from what you're doing. Approximately what percentage of released inmates show up at your local health department for follow-up TB care? And this is really important when you're looking at a discharge plan and a formal written discharge plan. When you look, anecdotally, I will tell you that when I was at the jail and we actually made appointments for our inmates that we thought were high priority and they went to the health department, typically we had less than 5% that actually showed up. But when we asked a little differently that question, we had probably between 26 and 49% that actually showed up, but they never got to the back because they did not want to stay. And so the secretary or whoever is sitting at the front notifies the back uh, nurse that this person showed up and then they're saying that they didn't have time to wait. They, you know, they just got out of jail. They don't want to have to sit there and really deal with bureaucracy, if you will. A lot of them aren't going to self-identify as inmates either. So if you don't have a good linkage with your local correctional facility, they're usually not going to come in waving their hands, hey, you just got out of jail, what do I do? They're, that's going to be something that most people don't want to announce to the public. And even sometimes if you ask them specifically if they've been to jail, they'll deny having been in, incarcerated. Absolutely. So we've laid some groundwork for you, and we hope we've, you know, educated you enough to be able to walk you through a jail and ask some very important questions. And I love this cartoon because truly the United States is the world leader in incarcerating people. Um, we currently have over 2.7 million people incarcerated in the United States. One in every 100 people. That, say, that, say that again. One, one in every 100, at least that's what I heard on the radio on the way in this morning, <laughs> you know, based on statistics we're making up as we go along. But actually, I believe it is one in every 100 individuals in America are incarcerated or under some form of correctional supervision. And, and if you think about that, one in every 100 people, that means somebody in your family, that means somebody in your neighborhood, that means it's not just people you don't know. We've got a lot of people locked up, and the people that are locked up are going to be getting out into the community. Very few people stay in prison for life, and even fewer have death penalties. So everybody that comes in is going to be getting out. And in prison statistics, 95% of people that are sentenced to prison get released to the community at some point um, after their incarceration or after their sentencing. So. We felt that the culture of corrections, and, and we want you to actually, you know, think about this a little differently too. What is culture? Culture, of course, this is a good definition. Integrated patterns of human behavior includes language, thoughts, communications, actions, um, beliefs, uh, institutions of racial, ethnic, religious, or social groups. Think about that de definition and now think about it in the, tech, in the context of a correctional facility. Liken that to a, another country. It really is its own community. And so when we look at this and we look at the culture, we're going to talk a little bit. Very little is written about it, and I am so happy to have found uh, this quote by Bill Gillespie 
on prison culture, and they call it prisonization. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about correction culture, uh, and we're going to talk about it and call it correctionalization because it's not just about the formation of an informal inmate code which develops from the individual characteristics of inmates and from institutional features of a prison. It really is about involving all aspects of that prison culture, but more. It includes the actions and behaviors of the staff as well as the uh, just not just prison but other facilities. It's not just about uh, the long term, short term can also have that happen. And so in looking at uh, these different variables in culture, we've got the standard ones, ethnicity, race, gender, um, whether they're spiritual or religious, uh, class, their age, their history of their culture, orientation in their, um, in their sexes, and language is a big par part of that. Not just those normal cultural variables, but also did they work in a facility prior to that, or have they been into a jail or prison prior to that, and what is their experience within other correctional facilities? Some secondary characteristics of prisonization, and we all know the famous Martha Stewart um, who ended up live, living for a short while in a correctional facility. Um, some of the secondary characteristics that really bring home that prisonization to the inmate population, recidivism, violence, do they have a violent crime versus a nonviolent crime? Do they have mental health issues? And there's a huge mental health population and they are working diligently with governors across the United States to try and really work on mental health issues and corrections. And what about degradation? Degradation is another issue. And I am uh, really taken with the Martha Stewart cover that possibly you may have seen, the zen of concrete, work where you live, live where you work. When you think about that, these inmates really do not have a lot of autonomy. Their variables really are about where they're at and what they've seen before. And so when you look at those inmate variables, medical and health provisions, some issues that correctional, all correctional facilities have is the availability of physicians. You may have a physician who is over the medical department that may be an OBGYN or a physician who is a family practitioner. There are some serious medical issues in correctional facilities However, sometimes because of what we call the medicalization of inmates, they're putting in tons of sick calls. Many of them put in multiple sick calls. I had an inmate who consistently put in at least 15 sick calls per day over the course of the six months that he was there. And it was very frustrating because you then have to weed all those out and you're the medical person trying to take care of 2,800 inmates and you've got this one person, it may be a real issue, but because of all the medicalization, uh, because of what they're doing, you may have to blow it off, so to speak, and you go, well, you know, I don't think you're really sick, that kind of thing. And so the staff gets hardened to that kind of behavior. Reporting of incidents. Sometimes the incidents are far worse than what was reported or even less than what was reported. And so you, the medical people, have to weed that out as well as deal with the staff, the correctional staff, who may be saying, oh, I just faking it, don't worry about it. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, another issue is the range and diversity of diet. That if you have someone who is a Muslim, for example, they still have to eat the same foods unless they go through medical and have a special diet prescribed for them. And in some facilities, they don't have special diets. And so they have to pick things off of their plates. Um, and that becomes a real degradation type issue. 
Recreation and sports, again, is another uh, area where they really have very little control. It is all about whatever's happening with the staff at that particular point. And many of them may not, many facilities may not have TV, videos, computers, and those kinds of things actually keep the inmates calm, believe it or not. Um, or it can create a riot. It all depends on who wants to watch what. Um, so those are some things. I actually had the opportunity to work in a correctional facility where they had absolutely no TVs, and every inmate was given two toothbrushes. One toothbrush was for brushing their teeth. The other one was if they weren't working, they were actually using that toothbrush to clean the cells. So it gave them something to do so they didn't just sit there and think, and sometimes that can be a problem. Inmate manipulation plays a huge role in the correctionalization of inmates and staff. If there's crowding, if you have a small cell with a lot of people in there, that can become a real issue. It's whoever's top dog in that particular area. And overcrowding really is a, a huge issue with a lot of the facilities around the United States nowadays. There is a denial of responsibility. Inmates don't like being told when to get up, when to wash, when the lights go on, when the lights go off. And so they tend to, you know, try to be the big man and the big dog and, you know, have as much control as they can over that particular type of, uh, or over their own setting. Their work they see as menial or uninteresting in many time, many cases. It really isn't about rehabilitation, although many correctional facilities are now taking inmates and letting them work and gain a trade, and I think that's a, an absolutely fantastic thing to have happen. Remember, inmates are isolated from their families, from correspondence, every piece of paper that comes into an inmate gets screened by a correctional officer, and in addition, everything that goes out gets screened. So think about when you, the public health, you're trying to give education to an inmate, you actually have to ask the officer if this inmate can have this or can you put it in their property so when they get released. These are some things you really have to um, build within your policies as well. Make sure that that training happens and occurs. And as far as relationships, they truly have feel isolated because many of their family has disowned them because they've just been incarcerated. And so they build relationships with the people that are in their own facilities in the cells with them, and it's not always the ideal uh, person that they want to be uh, working with. They have very little control over themselves. They get cell ser searches um, occurring all the time. Medical issues are a real problem. Think about how you are when you go uh, to the store. You have a headache. You're going to pick up two tile, you know, pick up some Tylenol, and you can go to your medicine cabinet and just take two out whenever you want. For an inmate. They actually, if they have a headache, in many facilities have to put in a sick call. The nurse then has to pick that up. It gets screened. They have to do a triage on that. They can't just hand them two Tylenol. They need to make sure this isn't a serious problem. And so they may get those two Tylenol two days later. So you really have to look at that. And the other issue is when you do have, as Chief Wiles talked about, keep on person medication, they may be getting all those Tylenol over the counter, keeping them on their person, taking them, and so you might not find out that they've had a fever or a cough or a cold or something like that because all of those things um, are on the custodial side, not the medical side. So that may be an issue when you're looking at TB symptoms. You want to go and find out are they getting any of those medications. There's also a medication schedule that is very strictly adhered to, and it isn't always conducive with the medications that are given. And so when you look at all of those things, the impact of health disparities on the inmate, for the individual, it can 
really impact them with increased morbidity, decreased quality of life, perceptions of injustice. For society, again, same thing, social inequality. But for an inmate, they can really lead to delayed diagnosis in TB and an increase in the complexities of the diseases, which, of course, harbors more transmission. So those are some things you really need to look at when you're thinking TB in an inmate population. Corrections really harbors all of the issues that we've talked about with regards to culture and even more. Staff prejudices, preconceived notions. Well, he's always been, you know, someone who gave us trouble, so we're just going to deal with him like that anyway. Um, corrections and inmates. Inmates have manipulative nature, and most of it is because of their prior experiences within these correctional facilities or within society. Things aren't working out there, so they expect them not to work within the confines of uh, this. And so now I want to talk, uh, I want to turn this over to Chief Wiles to talk a little bit about the different training paradigms. Now let's talk a little bit about how the correctional staff is different and why we're different as well. You know, number one, we're living with the inmates eight hours a day. We're going to pick up some of those behaviors. I'm going to tell you, overall, corrections, you're not going to find us to be a real jolly bunch. We're going to have a lot of cynicism, a lot of sarcasm in our attitudes because, you know, we keep saying we won't get fooled again, but we're fooled all the time. We're manipulated. Nobody is ever telling us the truth. Everybody is always lying to us, including the inmates. You know, look at our training paradigms. Look at the way corrections is, contrained, is trained, and let's compare that to, way, to the way people in medical and social services fields are trained. And the reason I'm contrasting these is because those are typically your two major groups that are working as staff inside a correctional facility. They're going to have custody or operations or security or whatever they call it in that, in that particular jail. And you're going to have medical, social service, program type staff. And there is just about always a huge clash between these two cultures. And that starts back in the very beginning, back when we're first taking the training and getting the education that it takes for us to become the kind of people that we are in our professions. In a corrections perspective, most corrections go through a training that is very similar to that of police officers or law enforcement. A lot of times they'll have actually overlapping training in, in some areas. There, there's, there's quite a bit of similarities. And in corrections, it's, it's emphasized from the very beginning that it's security over all else. Everything is about care, custody, and control. Now that care part oftentimes is pushed way back to the back and the custody and control is, is foremost. But there's still a certification. Most people have to have a in-service training, just like you're getting CEUs. They have to have some kind of standard that they maintain for their training. But you got to remember, too, that corrections is often in an adversarial role, role. We're taught in our academy training, essentially, that everyone's out to kill us from the first time they walk in. Our, all of our training, or a large part of it, is based on what we call hard skills, firearms, defensive tactics learning how to use OC spray, learning how to defend ourselves, and think about it from that perspective. Everybody's out to get us. We're in a dangerous profession. Everybody's out to lie to us. Everybody's out to get us. And you can see how some of this negativity and cynicism can often seep into an individual's personality. Also, learning is scenario-based in most correctional and law enforcement training. Because, like Ellen said back in the very beginning, there's not a lot of data. There's not a lot of research on a lot of these topics. We learn from other people's experiences. We learn from war stories, from anecdotes. Then contrast that with what you learn when you go through your medical or social service training. You're not looking at your patient in an adversarial role. You're looking at, at, at a patient or a client as being somebody that's in a willing relationship with you. They're coming to you wanting help. You know, they're certainly not out to kill you. You're an advocate. You're looking at improving society, doing no harm, making things better. You know, we're learning about locking them up and throwing away the key. Learning in medical and social services is, is through a specific method. You've got evidence-based practices. You do research. You have statistics. You're not just making this stuff up and telling stories. Now, just... Think a moment and just think about how different that is, what different backgrounds that we come from, and it's really no wonder that we clash. 
we talked earlier about the chain of command, that it's, even how you deal with each other within your systems is so different. In corrections, you know, if we wanted you to think, you know, we would have given you a brain. We, we spell everything out. They have everything, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. You'll have a lot of rigid adherence to written directives, those kind of things. And there's very little chance to have discretion or have any kind of autonomy in, in decision making. But you need to understand that chain of command, and you need to understand where people come from, because one of the ways that you can increase your understanding and create, increase your communication cross-culturally, so to speak, is to have cross-functional meetings or trainings. And we did that recently in Jacksonville. Ellen's group came down and we, we discussed, had a, had a three-day training that included correctional personnel, operations, line staff, some supervisory staff, and also some of our medical personnel. We had nurses, we had PAs, we had different kinds of, of medical personnel, and we, and we took this training together. And during that training, we talked about what we thought about each other. And here's some of the things that we learned that each side thought about each other. From the medical point of view, the medical, the medical professionals are saying we didn't get any support from the officers. They don't care about what we're doing. Officers are too dumb to understand medical issues. If you say anything that's got above two syllables in it, they're not going to get it. COs don't want to go out of their way for anything. They're all about just, you know, that's not my job. I'm going to do my eight, hit the gate, move on. That's not something that I'm going to do. A lot of times they felt like the officers were, in, were vindictive and wanted to punish inmates as opposed to helping them, that helping an inmate was indicative of some kind of sign of weakness. Another thing, too, is they would often describe correctional officers, hey, they're just, you know, they're just, they're bitter, they're upset because they want to be the police, they couldn't make it out there on the street, so by golly, they got stuck in the jail, now they're going to make everybody miserable. And they felt like the attitude of the officers was that to have anybody from medical question anything that they did, that they were giving up some kind of control. Now, from the other perspective, the corrections personnel see medical as inmate lovers. They think you're going to give them everything. All they have to do is ask for a pill. You'll give it to them. That's not a problem. That you believe everything an inmate says because you're too stupid to understand inmates and too dumb to understand the chain of command. They think that the COs are here to simply serve the needs of medical, open the doors, you know, even though the door is locked, you've got to get somebody to open it for you, you know, just because of the fact that you're not another officer, sometimes, you know, they have resentment for those kind of things. Feel like medical has no respect for CO schedules. They don't care that you've got to run recreation, that you've got to run court, that you have to do accounts, like medication call, and you'll have those conflicting schedules, and, and it creates conflict. And then they often feel that anybody in medical who works in a jail, you're only working in there because you can't get a job somewhere else. If you were a real nurse or a real physician, you'd be working in a hospital or have your own private practice or something like that. You're only working here because you've had some kind of problem. You can't get a job anywhere else. So attitude is everything, and that's when we're dealing with each other or dealing with inmates. Remember, Medical and custody don't always talk to each other. We talk around each other. And we've got to learn to communicate. And part of that is understanding where each group comes from. Again, just to underline, staff and inmates in a correctional facility can become hardened to the environment. Somebody coming in from the outside may have to make more of an effort to communicate may have to put more forward than you would in any other kind of environment because of the cynicism, because of the negativity, and because of the sarcasm. Thank you, Chief Wells. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the development of some correction-specific education and trainings. And Chief Wilds really did a fantastic job about talking about the training that we did over there. One of the things that Southeastern National TB Center, and now other RTMCCs around the United States are getting on board with that as well. They're doing correction-specific education, educating public health as well as the custodial and the medical folks within the facilities. One of the things that we do is our three-day TB and corrections contact investigation and discharge planning course. We are working on a corrections toolkit that will be available, a, a series of forms and things. 
And the National TB Controllers Association, along with the National TB Nurses Coalition, re uh, really did a fantastic job about uh, developing some corrections liaison core competencies. And it's for the public health nurse and or case manager, whoever is going to be working with their correctional facilities, certain things that they need to learn and be able to understand about correctional facilities. For the Southeastern National TV Center, we also have a special populations corrections web page that is on our uh, different uh, websites, and a technical assistance and mini fellowship where you can actually um, join with us and we will take you into a correctional facility, a jail, a prison, um, depending upon what you need, and really look at some of the issues that happen and occur within your own facility and see how we can work through those things. In talking about cultural competency and the continuum uh, that we have for TB programs in corrections, really everybody on this call is at some point along this continuum. Hopefully you're not at the cultural destructiveness, but I can tell you that in a lot of correctional facilities, that's where they're at. They haven't come up to the 21st century. They're still working in the good old boy system. Not that that's a bad thing if that's working for them, but sometimes they need to get to the point where you want to get a little bit further along there. The cultural incapacity, um, that may be an area where if you're talking to your correctional facilities, it will be demonstrated quickly in the discussions that you have. And that's really an apathy or a not caring. And we've heard some terminology such as, um, well, they don't care, you know, what they've got in their facility. Every inmate gets treated the same no matter what. We don't have special diets. We don't have, you know, special language lines. We don't do any of that. And so that really is an incapacity for that correctional facility to move forward on this continuum. We also have cultural blindness, and I hear this more often than I care to count, don't look, don't tell, if it doesn't happen in my facility. We don't have TB in our facility, and I can tell you when I first started in uh, a county jail, I had an inmate who we suspected had TB, we collected one sputum, put him in a what I thought was an isolation cell at the time, we're talking 28 years ago, um, and what happened was, I came back the next day and said, where's my inmate? And they said, which inmate? And I asked about it, and they said, we don't have TB in our facility. And I said, but I had to report him to the health department, and they said, we don't have TB in our facility. He's already gone. You didn't do anything. And so that's really a, a blindness. Um, if you don't have that, or if you have that particular piece, you really want to try and do a lot of education, and you may have to do it a little differently, and that's where we can, you know, assist you in that particular aspect as well. Sometimes just getting your foot in the door, and that really is what cultural pre-competence is about, getting them to begin to care about their inmates, and many of them are all required to do cultural diversity training now, so at some point maybe you can you know, slip some things like that into your training and your education when you're doing uh, those kinds of things. Cultural pre-competence really is about beginning that basic cultural competence. And then when you get into that basic cultural competence, you then begin to see how each one can react and how when you need to do some education, maybe that case-based scenario information is very helpful. Take a case that actually happened in their facility. They may not have known about it. You walk them through, and it's not about pointing fingers. It's about making that transition to that cultural competence. And when you get to advanced cultural competence, you really are using those corrections liaison court competencies. Um, oh, sorry, wrong way. Want to talk a little bit about a case example? 
and tru truly happened to a very seasoned health department nurse, and I consider this person extremely knowledgeable uh, in TB. But it's very important to identify certain areas of what is happening. An inmate was identified in intake as a suspect for TB and identified with symptoms of active disease, the cough, the fever, the weight loss, immediately placed into isolation, and the health service administrator notified the health department the very next day. They collected the sputum, and of course it returned positive, 4 plus, 4 plus, and 3 plus. The inmate, however, was released to the community after two weeks in isolation, and the health department didn't get notified until a few days later. According to the health department nurse, went through all the steps over the phone with that particular uh, health service administrator and said, don't really have to do a contact uh, investigation at the facility. Everything was done correctly. You guys did a great job. They tested uh, two people, I believe, the officer in booking as well as the arresting officer, and both were negative. Well, here's the rest of the story. The rest of the story is after a year, uh, a regular quality assurance evaluation was done at the health department, and we decided to go into the facility and review the records at that particular facility as well. The health department considered uh, the record to be complete, and it truly was, according to the health department information. They did a fantastic job of getting symptoms, isolating people. Um, the documentation was there. The medication regimen was there. Everything was perfect. Then we viewed the record from the local jail. And it took them a day or two to actually get that record. So that's an important piece, too. You need to make sure you notify them. Well, the rest of the story is the documentation in the medical record at the jail facility, the inmate was identified in intake, and in the quotes you will see, immediately removed and placed in MISO number 8, which is their medical isolation, number 8, with two other inmates. Beautiful documentation. And we said, is that truly isolation? So we asked the question again, What's your where's your isolation room? And the, the response from the health service administrator as well as the officer was, well, they're all isolation rooms. So we asked a little differently, and this is where she got that statement, which one sucks there instead of blowing air? And their response was, oh, that would be number one, the only cell with a solid door. And so when we went back and actually identified uh, contacts, we actually were able to find 67 contacts one year later. Over half of those had returned to the facility, and they had already done uh, skin tests on them, and many of those were positive skin tests. So as you can see, education is important, but defining terminology is extremely important, as well as getting and receiving a copy of that record in the jail. Education, we really did uh, a great job. The officers, the medical staff, everybody was really wonderful in identifying those contacts. And so it was recommended to do some specific training regarding screening, and the officers and medical staff were included in that training, and the officers actually came up with a great scenario when the inmate is first coming into the facility, we outlined some uh, just three to five cough questions, put it right there on the wall, so as the officer was patting the inmate down, what they were asking were some of those questions, and the inmate you know, was afraid of what the officer was going to find in their pockets. So they really didn't do a whole lot of lying, and so they were telling the officers a lot more information than what they were telling the medical people. And so they were given another chance for redemption. This time, they had a uh, different inmate booked into the facility, no complaints to medical staff. Officer was uh, the one who witnessed the inmate coughing, asked about symptoms, asked, uh, 
asked, took this inmate back to the medical staff, asked more specific questions, and lo and behold, this was somebody who had been at the health department, had not shown up for medications for several months, was infectious, was restarted on medications, and they identified five contacts, none with infection. And so, in summary, um, I really want Chief Wiles to go over this so that we can really bring it all home. Yes. Remember, uh, everything that we've been over today, one of the big things that we've talked about is understand the administrative structure of the facilities that you're responsible for or the ones that you'll be in contact with in your area. That's very important. Understand prisonization and correctionalization. Make sure that you get definitions of the terms. Don't assume. Make sure that you know what it means in your area. But if you understand this correctionalization and where people come from, it should help you increase your communication and collaboration with the correctional staff in your facilities. If possible, look for ways to train and educate together. Knowing where people come from, knowing how they think, is, is very important to coming up with new ideas. Look for ways to, to do things together. As an example, in our facility, we've had public health as our um, health care provider for the entire facility. They provide all of our correctional health care now. We're going on our second year. We're not the first that's done it, but we are, we're one of a few that have done that, and I believe we're the largest right now. And it's been a uh, extremely positive and incredible experience. No slam or anything wrong with the other kinds of medical care that we've had. We've been self-operated, you know, hired our own medical staff and, and have run our facility that way. We've also hired private for-profit health care um, companies to come in and provide our health care. But now with public health, the liaison, we, we no longer have a need for that real that liaison position because we're together on this. And what I'm really hoping in the future is as we establish more and more linkages with our communities and with community health care and with the advent of electronic medical records, a lot of these things that cause a lot of difficulties for us now, I'm hoping will become much, much easier in the future. But in the, until that future gets here and all those records are linked together, it's very important for us to work together and try to understand each other's culture. And if you understand the culture of corrections, that's going to aid you in making changes occur and for us all to arrest TB and stop the spread of this disease. Absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, you have actually identified a uh, person in your custodial staff who actually is the liaison between those two. Yes, our um, captain who's in charge of custody, and by captain, that's an individual who's, who's got some significant, you know, supervisory, really more of a management type person, and they've got the rank in order to basically cut through the BS and, and get to the things that they need to do, and they've got the authority to make sure that, um, to in, encourage people to get along, you know, and and communicate across the medical the medical lines. We have monthly, not just monthly meetings, we have weekly meetings, various and assorted. We have an infectious disease meeting weekly that includes custody and medical staff. You know, we've got uh, a cross-functional security committee where we have medical and mental health on the security committee making the decisions on who comes in, who goes out of isolation. We've just about integrated every piece of our operation with medical, and it's, and it's been to everyone's benefit. So it truly is all about change and learning to recognize the culture, and that's really what's going to aid in identifying and working through those challenges. It'll become a win-win situation. So with that, we thank you very much for sitting through this webinar, and what we'd like to do now is open the floor for questions. Questions will be taken on a first-come basis and will be answered given the allotted time. You will see rotating slides for instructions to ask your question online, and we're going to ask the operator to now provide some instructions to ask your question by phone. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. Your line will then be briefly accessed from the conference to obtain information. 
If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. If you are using a speakerphone, we ask that you please lift your handset before entering your request. One moment, please, for the first question. Ellen, we have a question for you. This is for Chief Wilds. You mentioned that public health is your contracted medical provider for your jail now. How did, you, how did that transition occur, and did you experience any challenges? It wasn't a particularly easy transition, as you can imagine. It, it, it's very similar, even though we had changed providers before. It's always difficult when you go from one system or even one provider to another, but it was the challenge in this case was it truly was, and I hate to use the word paradigm again twice in one day, but it really was a paradigm change because we went from providing the very basic, you know, the minimal medical care to, I won't say it's like, you know, a maximum, nobody's going to be getting plastic surgery or anything like that while they're there, but going to, some, going to a whole different philosophy of these they're inmates now, but they're also part of the larger community. And we quickly realized in talking with public health that we were dealing with the same inmates in the clinics and the, the same people in the clinics and the community were our inmates. They're going back and forth and to really have an impact on disease, and, and not just TB, but STDs and many other diseases in our community. This was a good way to do something that was specific for our, the, the, the public health of our entire community. Yes, we had to do a contract. Um, we, our biggest challenge was getting the attorneys to agree between the city and the health department. That was our biggest challenge. After we got that done, then it was just a matter of, of being, able, uh, being able to work together and asking for, um, we did a lot of specific training during the changeover process, working with medical, letting medical do our, our in-service training for corrections, again, getting, getting to know each other and making sure that that medical provider was a part, became an integral part of our correctional culture. Thank you. We have another question that came in through the computer. They'd like to know if you have any experience with XDR-TB or MDR-TB. You want to answer that? Yeah, we don't have any, any locally in our facility. We've not had any identified XDR or MDR. I do know there are facilities, and I've talked to people from facilities that have had to deal with it. And yes, that's, um, that's a whole other story right there. It can be very serious. And Remember, in a correctional facility, people don't take care of themselves very well on the outside. A lot of folks don't, and they don't seek medical care on the outside. And like Ellen said, they come in, they begin seeking medical care. That's when you can intervene in this process, and you can hopefully recognize MDR or XDR on a quick basis because we've got a large amount of people who are immunocompromised in our correctional populations. You've got a lot of people who are HIV positive. And just if you, if you think about it from that perspective, think about how quickly one of those more virulent strains can spread through that kind of a population. And uh, I will say that Chief Wilds, being the head of the facility, would know a lot of that information, whereas in many facilities, the regular custodial person that you're working with should not be knowing if an inmate has XDR or MDR TB. They would just know how they have to protect themselves. And that actually becomes an issue in correctional facilities because they all want to know what, what they've got. And instead, you need to educate them as to how you need to protect yourself. Yes, everybody talks universal precautions, but we also add another layer on that universal precaution. We just, we just identify to the correctional staff if something that somebody has is airborne or bloodborne. And that's really all they need to know. We have a certain protocol if it's airborne, and we have a certain protocol if it's bloodborne. And that usually keeps down um, a lot of the, of the fear factor that we experience. Thank you. We have a few other questions that are coming in now, and a lot of them relate to the negative pressure rooms. Um, and I'll kind of com combine them so you can address them both at the same time. One of the questions relates to um, whether or not all jails in the area have negative pressure rooms 
and are they willing to accept and house people with TB? Because in this one facility, there's uh, one area, there's only one negative pressure room and the jail is resistant to house TB there. And then we have another question about the AIIR rooms and um, you know, what do you do with the suspect cases? So can you comment on those? Well, uh, I can actually comment. This is Ellen. And I know when I was over the correctional facilities at the TB program at the state health office, we actually had identified in Florida how many facilities actually had negative pressure rooms. And now there, of course, the new terminology is negative airborne infection isolation rooms. Um, we had almost 50, 50 to 60 percent that actually had some form of a negative airborne infection isolation room. Then we started identifying how many actually worked, and that was another whole issue um, because a lot of these airborne infection isolation rooms are tied into the existing air conditioning uh, ducts. And so what was happening was they would work at some point during the day, but when the air conditioning went on in a different area, it actually was positive pressure, and we were able to identify that. And so there were those kinds of issues that you really do need someone who understands not just the engineer who's, you know, retrofitting a jail cell to tie it into existing uh, architecture, but you need someone who really understands negative pressure isolation or negative airborne infection isolation rooms. Um, and the other question, do you have anything to add to that? You know, the other part of that question is, I think, was what can you do to get somebody to get one if they don't have one, or would other facilities share? That is very dependent on, on your particular region. I know we do have some surrounding counties in our area who do not have um, negative air pressure cells. Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, when they get somebody with TB, they're on the phone calling me up and saying, hey, can you have that guy? If I can, I will. But in a lot of cases, I can't. Like I said earlier, we're extremely overcrowded. And a lot of times, I've got every one of mine filled up with somebody who needs to be in there. Also, and it, it's, it's, a, it's something that people, nobody wants to spend money on a jail to begin with. But you may be able to elicit some allies if your correctional personnel have a union or if you can get to the correctional mm -hmm. administrator and talk about workers' comp type issues and it's, it's more for the protection of staff, sometimes coming from a different direction. That's actually how we got our air pressure cells and they were retrofitted was um, we kind of allied with our union that represents our correctional personnel and presented it as an officer safety issue and a public safety issue, and this was far before we got the public health department in there, and we're, we're able to convince it. But then, see, that was also during a year when it was a good budget year and we could afford to do those things. With the way the budget is right now, you know, and I'm sure it's like that in a lot of communities, having funds available to do those kind of things can be really difficult. So if you don't have a negative pressure cell available in your facility, and you need to work with the facility to determine now what you're going to do when you come up with a case. Because the worst thing to do is to try to deal by crisis and try to stay on the phone all night seeing who's going to take somebody. Get a memorandum of understanding with your local hospital. You know, find where the nearest facility is, see if you can work out a trade. You know, a lot of times that's, that's the way we'll do it. We'll, we'll do a little mini contract and, you know, I'll take a TV guy if you'll take a guy who's being a pain in our behind or something like that, you know, or needs a change of environment. And we try to work it out that way. And I think one of the other issues, because we've done this in, in the facility I was in, we did not have negative airborne infection isolation rooms until probably a couple of years ago. And so we contracted with one of the other facilities. One of the issues you need to make sure and work out is their legal status. Can they leave the county and go to another county because they won't be going to court during that period that they're housed in that other area? So you need to look at that. Thank you. Ellen and Tara, we have a phone caller with a question. Operator, would you please patch them in? Yes, our first question comes from the line of Cynthia Day. Please proceed with your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, great. I'm calling from the Office of Public Health in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I work in the um, Wetmore Tuberculosis Clinic. My question is regarding the um, the, the contract that's provided between the facilities. I think my question is to the chief regarding the specific services that public health provides. Is it direct? services to your facility like on-site personnel and drugs provided by the state? Yes, it's direct services. Um, we have, I believe it's uh, 125 FTEs who actually work inside, you know, different positions who work inside the facility. Have two physicians, one full-time psychiatrist. I believe we're up to four PAs right now and then a variety of um, nursing and other medical personnel who actually perform services inside the facility. We do not have an infirmary. We do have a clinic area, and that's essentially how um, the public health services is running it. The operation is they're trying to, to mirror as much as possible the way a clinic actually runs out on the street. And uh, it's kind of funny. They don't identify, if any on the paperwork, they don't identify it as the pretrial detention facility or the jail clinic. They actually identify as the Bay Street Clinic because in Jacksonville, that's the street that the jail is located on. So when the people get out and they're sharing medical records or anything else, they're not facing that inmate stigma of having been treated in a correctional facility. They can pass their records along as having been treated at, at the Bay Street Clinic. But yes, they're we're in there. We're all in there together. Okay. Do they come to you? Um, is this something held on a weekly or a monthly basis? Are they there every day? No, no, they're there. This is their work site. They're there oh, every okay. four hours a day. We have we have we have um, 24 hour 365 okay. medical care. These are and people. What state are you in? I'm sorry. Say that again. What state are you located in? Florida. Oh, you're in Florida. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for answering the questions. Very interesting. Thank you. We have one more question from the computer, and it relates to federal facilities. This um, individual from public health is saying that they get information from the local detention center about the location of an inmate who was released to a federal facility, and then when they try to um, connect with the federal facility, they can't tell us the actual location. So they're forced to go to their counterparts at the state level to try to track down this inmate. So is there some better way to try to get this information directly? Uh, yes, this is Ellen. I can tell you that most federal inmates, you can actually go online to the Bureau of Prisons and you will see that. I don't have the actual website as we speak uh, right in front of me, but if you just use any search engine for uh, Inmate Lookup Bureau of Prisons, you will be able to uh, just link to that. The other thing is uh, Diana Olive, who is in Washington, D.C., is the nursing, if you will, uh, liaison for all of the Bureau of Prisons in all of the federal facilities in uh, the United States. Diana Schneider, a little bit differently, is with the ICE facilities. And those two work very closely and hand in hand. So if, in fact, you have any, uh, you know, any questions related to that, we, we really um, may be able to help facilitate that particular dialogue so that you can find out a little bit more information. But the Bureau of Prisons is over all of the federal facilities. Uh, the Division of Immigration and Health Services is o are over the ICE facilities, and they're actually linked to Homeland Security. So I think that might help you a little bit. I just thought about something, too, that you may also be experiencing. A lot of, of local facilities will house several prisoners on contract, and part of that contract is usually uh, one of these nice blanket statements like, you will provide no information concerning federal prisoners to the public. The BFP wants to still maintain the control of information. You may need to work the chain of command in your particular facility. Try to find somebody either in medical or in, on the custody staff, that classification supervisor, somebody like that that can kind of cut through that red tape because, again, you know, if it says it in writing, then we certainly can't make a decision on our own. Right. We have to follow that writing precisely, so you need to get up to the point 
work that hierarchy till you find the point that, uh, that somebody can make a decision. And it's generally the jail administrator um, or their particular uh, administrative lieutenant or whoever, something, somebody higher up in that uh, administrative area. Thank you. We are approaching 1230, so I just want to let people know that if they need to log off, they can now at this point, but we will still continue to take questions as long as Ellen and Tara are willing to uh, receive them. We do have another caller, so operator, would you please patch that person in? Yes, of course. Our next question comes from the line of Vincent Fears. Please proceed with your question. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation. I wanted to see if you could assess and contrast the potential risk for the spread of TB if an inmate with infectious TB was placed in a holding cell versus a dorm versus an open room or versus the day room. And are there typically any uh, engineering controls in place to improve the quality of the air in such situations? Oh, great question. Um, and I'm guessing you're probably from public health. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, we find is every facility is different. And some facilities have recirculated air. Some dorms actually have the ability to open the windows, and so you get air circulating to the outside. Um, you really need to identify what's happening in that particular facility. One of the other challenges we have is there's not a lot of data um, that has been published regarding contact investigations in correctional facilities and the number of skin test conversions, those kinds of things. Now, I will tell you anecdotally, you know, I've got stories up, you know, uh, all over the place because we have really seen things happening, like the smaller size cell and the more inmates in it. Um, for example, I'll give you uh, just a very quick example. We had an inmate who had three plus sputums that was in a diabetic clinic and there were 11 other diabetics. They all sat in a holding cell for approximately six hours. During that time, they would take one or two out to go and, you know, uh, get the education from the doctor and then they go back into that particular holding cell. Now, this cell was probably a 10 by 10 cell. Um, during that time, when we identified the you know, number of people that we needed to look at for contact investigation, that cell was kind of left out because it was under that eight hour period, so they didn't think about that. Well, after the fact, we decided those were high priority inmates, and so we wanted to get that um, that testing done, and we found 72% actually had converted their skin test just in that six-hour period. So is that written anywhere? Unfortunately not, um, because we're, we're public health and we're always busy, and we never get a chance to write it down. But these kinds of things is some, are things that you want to identify in your contact investigation, and the more I encourage everyone Please, if you have these kinds of situations, get them out and publish print because we really need this kind of information and this kind of scrutiny when we're looking at contact investigations. I Anything know, to add to that? I know it, this is another story, but it, it is particular to the environment, to your particular facility, the place that, that you're going to be dealing with. But I know one of the first things that we noticed when we began skin testing staff annually, and this is some years back, is we noticed that we had, you know, some individuals test positive on about, it was about the average amount, you know, so it wasn't that big a deal. But then we started really looking at, and again, this is why sometimes it's important to know who does what in a facility. We started looking at the people, and all of a sudden we realized, my gosh, it's all our correctional transportation officers. You know, why on earth would the transportation officers be all testing positive? And, of course, they're transporting inmates in an enclosed van every single day. Mm -hmm. The air is circulating between the back and the front. And from that process, we were able to change the way our vans are now. Now we have um, a different type of ventilation. We have two compartments in the back of the transport van where the, the air vents to the, to the roof of the vehicle, both 
separate for each compartment and there's separate venting for the officer as well. That's just one example of how, how important airflow is. You may also want to try to see, and this can also be kind of difficult and you've got to get to the right person, see if you can go ahead and uh, get a schematic of the air system or at least know where to get it. They may not give it to you because of security reasons, so where you can access that kind of information, who you would need to talk to if you had a need to know in your facility. And of course, all that happens when you meet regularly uh, uh, on a regular basis with, between your public health unit and your uh, facility. Those are the kinds of things that you want to talk about. Thank you. Great question. We have a few more questions. First, has quantifiron gold or other whole blood testing been used for screening in this setting? Another great question. Um, I can tell you that in some large jail facilities, it has been used at, with great success. Uh, Cook County Jail was using it. Uh, they were doing a pilot study, and I believe they're only doing it in certain areas now of their jail. And Los Angeles County Jail was doing it, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody who's out there and listening. Um, but if you're doing it in your facility, that, that truly is a great use of the Quantifier on TB Gold. In your staff, not necessarily in the inmates, but in the staff where you'll be able to capture a lot of this happening. Uh, eventually, we may get to the point where we can use the Quantifier on uh, TB Gold or the Intube for inmates. And for those of you who don't know about what Quantiferon TB Gold or the in-kind is, uh, it is an actual blood test and you get a printout of what the response is. You get a lab slip as opposed to someone just reading it and writing it down on a piece of paper. And so there may be a little bit more importance put on this particular test. So that, again, is another very important piece that as new technology happens, we want to bring that to you and really get this uh, working in those kinds of settings. It is a little bit more expensive, and we've been using the skin test for 100 years. Um, so it, it may take a little transitioning. And again, we, you know, statistics and things are, are very scarce right now, so we really want to look at what's happening out there. And if you are using it, that would be great to know that as well. Thank you. Hope it answered the question. Here's another question. How do you get jail administration to agree to annual TB testing for employees? Um, currently, it's voluntary and they have poor turnout. The best way I can answer that is through education, education of the staff of why it is important to them to know that. And one of, the, one of the easiest ways to do that is, again, tell the stories, give examples, you know, share, share what you've heard in other places, share the story about the transportation officers. And it's not just what well, a correctional staff needs to understand. It's not just about them and being tough and they can fight off disease, you know, with their Superman cape and everything. But they also need to think about the fact that they go home to their families every night and anything that they're being exposed to, they can also bring in. So sometimes it takes coming at it from that perspective for the staff to realize why it's important for them to go through it. Also, you got to kind of break down that barrier of distrust. They're going to, the first year we did the annual testing, it, it was, we, we had a low turnout. It was very difficult. We were, I couldn't understand it. I'm thinking, why wouldn't you want to know? And my also my thought was, heck, it's free. I won't get anything if it's free, but other people don't think that way. They have a distrust of those kind of things. So we went on a huge training and education campaign explaining, and we had triple the turnout the next year. And in the following year, I'm not, I don't think we had anybody refuse. And again, when it starts gaining that momentum and they start getting peer pressure from their peers or they see that other people you know, aren't afraid of getting it done or see it as important um, or see it as mandatory. And again, if, if you're dealing with a unionized group, using the union as your ally it is important. Also use the jail administrator as your ally. And again, this depends on, on that particular correctional culture. A lot of times jail administrators may be uh, real cyclical, to say it nicely. Every time a new sheriff comes in, you're going to get a new jail administrator. And 
being the jail administrator isn't always a reward. Sometimes that's a punishment. So it, you've got to understand the culture in your particular facility to try to figure out what will work for you to, to get those staff tested. And, and I can tell you that many uh, prison facilities may have gone to mandatory te uh, screening and or testing. And that's important to note because when you write it into your policy, regardless of who the new sheriff is, the policy has to get changed. And that takes a process. And so when you write that in, even though it's uh, mandatory, sometimes it's not always supervised appropriately, and that's where your infection control program really can help with those statistics and explaining, you know, well, it's mandatory, but we only had a 65% turnout. So what's happening? Maybe the lieutenants or the shift sergeants aren't able to, you know, educate their people and say, you know, I'm giving you time to go down and get your skin test. So that's another piece that you might want to, through that training and education and those meetings, um, work your way up to. That's a good point Ellen just made, too, is, is make testing work for the facility. If you're just offering the testing and the reading between 8 o'clock and 9 a.m., Monday through Friday, you're going to have a problem getting everybody tested in a 24-hour-a-day facility. When we started doing it, again, that was another thing we changed after the first year. Public health came in on each shift, and we did it right um, in conjunction with the roll call, which most facilities will have like a roll call or a lineup or something like that where the officers are all together prior to reporting for duty. So you already had that audience right there, and we would run them through as quickly as possible during that, that point in time, making it as convenient as possible for the officers. Thank you. Here's another question for you. Is there an algorithm for evaluating potential TB cases based on symptom review, skin test results, chest x-ray findings? Absolutely. This is Ellen again. Um, in the back of the new prevention and control of TB in uh, correctional and detention facilities, there is an algorithm that explains all about um, how to go through that symptom screening as well as the TST and chest x-rays and when you should do them. That's all very nicely laid out in those new 2006 guidelines. And you can obtain those guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control um, on their website. You can order them and they will send as many as you ask for. Um, directly to you. We also have a link to those guidelines on the SNTC website. So absolutely great question. Can you guys comment on the use of the screening chest x-ray or mini film on booking to the correctional facility? Do you feel this is an effective way to pick up TB cases? Chief Wilde keeps pointing to me and saying it's your, <laughs> it's, it's your question. Um, I can tell you that um, from looking at the statistics through Cook County Jail in Chicago as well as LA County Jail, they have had several write-ups where those mini chest x-rays did pick up a lot more and it is very, very effective when it comes to uh, picking up active disease. And remember, in a local correctional facility, you're really looking for active disease first. In a long-term facility, you're looking for infection, and that's where the skin test comes in. But in a short-term correctional facility, you're really looking at uh, active disease and trying to halt the disease spread throughout the facility. So those mini chest x-rays do pick up quite a bit, and I don't have the statistics here in front of me, and I apologize for that, but uh, I have read several, several articles that have that information. And so uh, if you need that information, we can actually point that in your direction. And I don't have it, but I wish I did. Again, if, if I have a chance to build another facility, that, that x-ray machine is going right up front along with that medical screening that's going to go up front when inmates come into the facility. We are, however, trying to seek some funding through the Department of Health right now to um, get something similar installed so that, so that we can do that, that pre-screening. I think it's very effective. And that, sh that mini chest x-ray should not negate symptom screening. Symptom screening goes hand in hand with that, and it is a very important piece of that as well. So 
Um, I know the article is well over 10 years old, so I, that's one of the reasons we don't have it on our website right at the moment. But I will look for that, and perhaps at some point we will look at maybe um, getting something like that up so that you will have that. Thank you. Here I've got another question that came in through the computer. It seems like the person who's posing this question does have an informal plan between corrections and the public health department in their area, but it seems um, that as the inmates are transferred to different facilities, say the local county jail onto state prison, that some of the complete medical information is missing. And so they'd like to know how the process can potentially be improved so that the receiving facilities get the complete information. Um, any ideas, tips? Well, that, that is going to be probably a meeting that you're going to need to, you may need to set up this meeting. And, and that's one thing I think people sometimes are reluctant to, they're waiting for somebody else to do this stuff. So you may need to try to set up a meeting and get a medical person from the state prison and a medical person from the local facility in the same room together and talk about what exactly needs to be transferred. Um, there, if either facility is accredited, then there are specific things that need to be transferred, and but not necessarily the complete information. And, and you know, hey, we're a governmental organization. We're going to do the minimum amount possible. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to go looking for work. So, getting getting the right kind of information passed back and forth may mean getting those individuals together. Also, remember too, the SNTC has this three-day training course, and that can assist with that type of communication, getting people on the same page at the different facilities, if you can get them into that training. Yeah, and I will say one of the things that we have found in the comments section, the evaluation comments uh, from the, that training is that this is one of the first areas where they, they've actually identified that that is a problem. And so, because we do have such a diverse population in our audience, at that three-day training, that is absolutely something that really can assist, yeah. Thank you. Here's another question. Under OSHA requirements, are correctional facilities required to test their population if they've had a TB transmission there in their facility? Not under OSHA, I believe, specifically. Um, usually, I know we lean on on public health for that. If public health comes in and says, "Hey, you guys need to be tested," you know, I'm not going to question that. We're going to do it. Um, there's there are OSHA guidelines, and there's other, like I said, accreditation, and, and most states have standard guidelines for control of infection and things like that. But as far as as I think maybe where the question is going is is trying to force compliance. That, that, can be, that can be difficult to force because even though the regulation may be there, there may not be any penalty for not complying with that regulation. Yeah, and, and I can tell you most correctional facilities are not governed by OSHA. Um, federal certainly is. However, most local and even state prisons are not governed by OSHA. However, uh, that doesn't mean that the staff can't make a request or a uh, personal complaint to OSHA, and OSHA will come in and they will inspect your facility and it will be written up in the newspaper and everywhere else and yeah, they, they do have certain things. But one of the things I want to point out is, as Chief Wild said, if in fact your staff, your facility staff is unionized, that is a good way to get them on board and do some training with them as well. And they may be your um, knight in shining armor, so to speak and help to get things happening a little bit differently. But again, as, as we said, it is scenario-based. Educate them sometimes, educating them sometimes with that those different scenarios really can get through to them why they need to do certain things. Thank you. I think we have one last question, and it's a general question about correctional facilities. Do your jails have central oversight, or is each one independent, and what is the source of funding? Most jails do not have any central oversight. They are independent. They're typically run by the county and typically run by the sheriff of the county. The sheriff is usually an elected 
official. So he's going to be beholden to his constituency in that county. Uh, most funding is going to be county-based. There's not a lot of state funding. The state funding goes into the state prison system as far as corrections goes. Most counties have to pay for their own inmates, so to speak, their own medical, their own food. And remember, running a jail is like running a little city. Anything that has to be provided on the outside, we're providing on the inside. Food, laundry, medication, you know, mental health care, all those kind of things not to mention a, a, a very high potential for litigation. You have a, you have a lot of liability in, in a correctional facility. Funding is, is a constant source of um, joy for me personally, trying to get it anyway. It's, it's just very dependent on, on what's available in that county, very dependent on the politics of that county. And like we said earlier, nobody wants to pay for a jail. Nobody wants to think of a country club jail or inmates getting especially better medical care than you or I can get. You know, that's, those, those are very difficult topics to, to talk about. Even if you talk about, well, it's, you know, it's about controlling infection. It's about the health of the entire community. Sometimes you have to play those politics to get the public to see why it's important for them. Another side benefit of collaborating with our local public health has been that we are beginning the process of being able to enter into grants together. We're um, entering into some research together. Those were things that we couldn't do with um, for-profit companies. So that's also been not, not a great source of revenue. Believe me, it's not going to get you out of all your revenue problems, but, it, but it's beginning to, to pay back a little bit the development of that relationship. And, and if I could add to that, not all jurisdictions actually are governed in that particular manner. So it really is very, very important that you identify who it is that's in charge of your local or your state um, facilities because in some states, the state prison is actually over the local jails, and which sometimes can be very good. I know in Florida about 15 years ago, they went away from that and they have a Florida Sheriff's Association. But also, um, in some counties, it could be run by the county commissioners instead of the sheriff. And so that becomes another little legal issue that if, you know, you're trying to get court orders or something like that, those are issues that you need to deal with as well. In other areas in the state of Florida, just in the state of Florida, we have a local jail that is run by a public health trust, and it's a huge consortium and it's very challenging to try and get changes to occur because it has to go through this huge series of screenings and reviews and trying to get everybody on board. So you really need to identify who it is in your particular jurisdiction that you need to ask and work with. Yeah, and jumping back on that a little bit, you mentioned about the issue of oversight. Beyond local oversight, a lot of facilities are accredited. The American Correctional Association is your typical accrediting body for local jails, and they have standards that, that have to be met for a facility to maintain accreditation. The state of Florida has a state accreditation as well, in addition to the, uh, to the ACA accreditation, and, uh, and most medical uh, operations that actually work inside correct correctional facilities will be accredited by the NCCHC, which is the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, and they look solely at the medical processes in those facilities. So that, that's some of the other um, oversight. And again, that, that is an administrative oversight. Other than losing your accreditation, there's, there's not much of a penalty if, if you choose not to meet the standards. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ellen and Tara, for joining and providing us with a lot of insight into the culture of corrections. And thank you to all our participants who joined us today. Please complete the online survey that will be emailed to your email address as you entered it as you logged in to this webinar. Certificates will be sent to the email address entered into your online evaluation. We look forward to offering future Arresting TB webinars, so look for those on the SNTC website as we advertise those. And next week we have another web conference and you're welcome to join. The topic is Country Specific Guides, Gaining Insights to Your Foreign-Born Clients, Culture and Beliefs About TB. 
Again, thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll join us next time. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.